Hello. Welcome to the Pirate History Podcast. My name is Matt. Thank you for listening. In warfare, the most important weapon in any general's arsenal is knowledge. Regardless of their strength in arms or soldiers or morale, knowledge is usually the key to victory. Certainly knowing your terrain, knowing yourself, both your strengths and your weaknesses, but perhaps most important of all is knowing your enemy. You need to know everything you can about their troops, their placement, their plans. But most of all, you need to know their strengths and weaknesses. Not in arms, or at least not only that, but who your enemy is. Why are they fighting? What's their motivation? How will they fight? And what weaknesses do they possess that you can best exploit? From atop the Santa Teresa Castle on Providence Island, Admiral Henry Morgan must have thought long and hard about this. The castle was his now, though the Spanish had built it. These islands, Providence and St. Catalina, were back in the hands of the English, their rightful masters in Morgan's thinking. Now they were valuable islands, especially to the English rovers. To the east lay the Mosquito Coast and the Spanish Main, which the English coveted. To the north lay the Cayman Islands, equally coveted by the English, and Jamaica, which was their jewel in the West Indies. But Morgan's eyes were pointed south and west. Looking south from the highest rampart of his new castle, all he could see was open ocean, but he knew that over the horizon lay Panama. That was the city where all the treasure from the Pacific coast of the Americas lay waiting to be trekked over a tiny strip of land to ships awaiting transport back to Spain. From his castle top, he'd have thought about the knowledge that he had and just how much he lacked. Francis Drake had taken that mule train from Panama 100 years before, but his guides had intimate knowledge of the land. Morgan was planning an assault on the city itself, and he only had guides of a dubious nature. He needed more information, and barring that, he needed a plan to pull back if the situation called for it. Thinking back to the near disaster at Maracaibo, more than anything, he needed to secure his lines of escape, at least once the city had been plundered. This island and the Santa Teresa Castle were a good place to start. A mere handful of men from his company left there could defend Providence against overwhelming Spanish numbers and provide his men away on the main a place to rest and reprovision after their business on the main was done. Morgan ordered 200 men to stay at the castle. That should be plenty. But he had another worry. His men were going to have to cross the Isthmus to reach Panama, and to do that they would have to leave their ships at anchor. He would need a defensible port on the coast of the North Sea, what today we call the Caribbean, to guard his ships while his men were on the march. Of course, to secure a defensible port, he would need to take one from the Spanish and then hold it for the weeks and weeks that were needed to take Panama. So there were two options before him. He would need, eventually, to reach the town called Venta de Cruces. That's the crossroads of Panama, which Drake had actually taken on his raid. It had a well-traveled road leading south from there to the city of Panama, but a fortress guarded each of the approaches to that town of Venta de Cruces. Now, Portobello was the first possibility. That was an overland route through the dense jungle to lead to Venta de Cruces. The second option was to take the Rio Chagres to Venta de Cruces, but that was guarded by the Fort San Lorenzo, which Morgan knew less about. Both of these options held potential plunder and possible pitfalls, but which one would be best? You see, Morgan lacked the knowledge to make an informed decision, and in a situation like this, the best option was to roll the dice, watch the outcome, and react. This is Episode 31, Panama. While Captain Morgan was underinformed, his enemy, on the other hand, was well prepared. One of the pieces of information that Morgan didn't have was that a man had deserted the raid on Rio de la Hacha and turned coat to inform the Spanish of Morgan's plan. 
The president of Panama, Don Juan Perez de Guzman, read these reports and acted accordingly. If Morgan planned to attack Panama, then he would counter him at every possible turn. Every man with even an inch of military training was recruited. Every mercenary from one of the neighboring colonies was hired. Letters of mark were sent out to Spanish privateers to attack English shipping all along the coast and to guard the approaches to Panama. Every slave at his disposal was sent to work in building defenses and serving the soldiers. Every Indian he could cajole was hired as a guide and a scout. The north coast of Panama was ready for an all-out war. The pirates, it was known, would attack from the coast, but exactly where the informant who had turned on Morgan didn't know, because Morgan himself had yet to make that decision. Guzman knew, though, that the English needed to guard their ships, and he knew as well as Morgan that only two forts were strong enough to serve. The first, the most likely, was Portobello. The president ordered the garrison there filled to bursting. He ordered her stores of food and powder stocked to withstand a long siege, and an army of farriers and blacksmiths and fletchers, masons and gunsmiths, well, they were all to prepare for an all-out assault on the castle. Now the road from Portobello leading south was a treacherous one, but it was the one used by the Spanish mule trains to transport their treasure to the coast. There was a path, but it was surrounded by dense jungles and bogs and sheer cliffs on both sides and occasionally unpassable rivers. So Guzman sent soldiers to build ambuscades all along the narrow winding road that the buccaneers would be forced to take from Portobello. That's a series of bulwarks that the Spanish soldiers could use to attack, fall back, and then attack again. And all of that is to say nothing of the additional army of snakes and jaguars and javelinas and deadly mosquitoes that would be assaulting the English all along this march. Even if Morgan managed to take the castles at Portobello, every step that he would take south would be paid for in blood. The second option, though, San Lorenzo and the Rio Chagres. The Spanish rarely used the river to transport their treasure. It was rife with just as many dangers as the mule path, all of the snakes and jaguars, and even more mosquitoes being along a river. But the river was home to, also, the great caimans. These are huge beasts, longer than most boats, lizards that would lay in wait under the water with huge, strong jaws full of sharp teeth. They moved too slowly to see, usually, until they struck, when in a flash of water and blood they burst from the water and would clamp those jaws upon any unwary prey, usually a deer or a boar, but they had killed men before, and would again, if given the chance. All of that, though, could be overcome by the Spanish. The real danger that they feared was the possibility of a boat capsizing and dumping all of her treasure into the river never to be seen again. Men were cheap, but that was unthinkable. Morgan, though, might decide to try the river. At least, Guzman couldn't afford not to prepare for it. He sent men there as well, to the fort at San Lorenzo, enough to fill every bed in the castle overlooking the river. These men oiled their guns, and they waxed their bowstrings. These were not the usual local militia. These were well-trained, disciplined men that would not shy away from a fight or surrender while they still stood. All along the river, ambuscades were placed as well. These were even easier to prepare, as the pirates would be confined to the river. A few towers built along the bank, back in the tree line, and a few trenches behind the undergrowth would serve for Spanish men to pick off the English buccaneers as they pleased, as long as they were smart and watched out for the Caymans. There was another piece of information that Morgan lacked. It was only just now reaching the ears of President Guzman in Panama and Governor Modiford back in Port Royal. In Europe, the monarchs of Spain and England had agreed to an accord, the Treaty of Madrid. There were four primary points to the treaty. First, the hostilities between England and Spain that had been going on for years were to end immediately. Second, Spain and England would agree not to molest each other's shipping and trade. Third, Spain officially recognized English holdings in the West Indies, including Jamaica and the Cayman Islands. This is an important point. And fourth, England 
was to end all acts of piracy against Spanish holdings, effective immediately. Any acts of piracy committed after the treaty was signed were the responsibility of the English crown and to be considered acts of war. It was basically a trade. You reign in the pirates and we'll let you keep Jamaica. Now, Governor Modiford realized just how bad this was immediately. He'd been told, ordered even, not to issue letters of mark. He'd been told to corral the buccaneers in, find them something else to do. He'd been told England and Spain were working towards something. And they'd tried that. And then... He went ahead and let Captain Morgan go to sea with the largest fleet that the Brethren of the Coast had ever mustered. So Modiford wrote letters to London, he wrote letters to Virginia and Boston, as quickly as possible, and he sent them on his fastest ships. His career, even his freedom potentially, was on the line. He offered up every defense he could come up with for his action, but as soon as the lords at Whitehall heard of it, they were furious, and they began pinning their own letters to Jamaica, to their king, and to the Spanish ambassador. Meanwhile, Captain Morgan had made his calculations. He had a total of 1,800 fighting men with him. If he left 200 in Providence to secure their rear, he would be left with 1,600 to attack the main, and that was more than enough to take Portobello and Panama. That was a real army. But in taking Portobello, his losses might be severe. San Lorenzo, on the other hand, was likely much less well defended, and his men were adept river travelers. If he were to send a smaller force, say 400 men, to take the castle at San Lorenzo, they might just take the city successfully. If it was far better defended than he thought, and this force of 400 was killed or captured, he would still be a full 1,200 men strong. He could then hear what the survivors from San Lorenzo had to report and attack either there with his full force, or change his mind and go to attack Portobello. It was a plan that minimized the risks and had the potential for the greatest rewards. He chose out Lieutenant Colonel Joseph Bradley to lead the expedition with 400 good men. Well, not good men, exactly, but experienced raiders. It was on the 10th of December, 1670, that Bradley set sail to cover the roughly 300 miles between Providence and San Lorenzo. The small fleet made good time, but no one knew exactly what to expect when they got there. When they finally saw what was waiting for them, it wasn't good. The mouth of the Chagres was guarded by San Lorenzo Castle, which sat atop a small mountain. I'm going to let Alexander Exclamellon describe it. He says, quote, This castle is built on a high mountain at the entry of the river, surrounded by strong palisades, or wooden walls, filled with earth which secures them as well as the best wall of stone or brick. The top of this mountain is, in a manner, divided into two parts, between which is a ditch thirty feet deep. The castle hath but one entry, and that by a drawbridge over this ditch. To the land it has four bastions, and to the sea two more. The south part is totally inaccessible, through the cragginess of the mountain. The north is surrounded by a river, which here is very broad, at the foot of the castle, or rather mountain, is a strong fort with eight great guns commanding the entry of the river. Not much lower are two other batteries, each of six pieces, to defend likewise the mouth of the river. At one side of the castle are two great storehouses of all sorts of warlike ammunition and merchandise, brought thither from the island country. Near these houses is a high pair of stairs, hewn out of the rock, to mount to the top of the castle. On the west is a small port, not above seven or eight fathoms deep, fit for small vessels, and of a good anchorage. Besides, before the castle, at the entry of the river, is a great rock, scarce to be described, but at low tides. End quote. So, just in case you missed any of that, on the seaward side of the fortress there were two gun batteries, each of six cannon. Any landing on the beach would be, at best, hazardous, with little hope of reaching even those batteries. Even if they did manage to dig themselves in on the beach, there was a tower that soared above these two batteries that could reach their ships at anchor and, potentially, sink their only means of escape. And that wasn't even the castle proper. Above these initial batteries, there was dug a thirty-foot-deep moat with only a single drawbridge to reach the fort. 
No, a frontal assault from the beach was right out. But these men were pirates. They were experienced in attacking an enemy from a direction they didn't expect when they were not looking. If they landed a few miles down the coast, then they could land safely and, potentially, take the fortress from the rear. This was a maneuver that they'd done time and time before. But there was still the trouble of that mountain. If they took the road to reach the rear of San Lorenzo, they would be faced with a steep and narrow stairway carved into the mountainside, guarded by hundreds of well-armed Spaniards. That, too, was less than optimal. In fact, that was really certain death. The only other option left to them was to land far from the castle and trek through miles of uncharted, dense, perilous jungle, and then up the side of an equally perilous mountainside with who knew what waiting for them under the canopy. Mosquitoes and jaguars, certainly, but perhaps an entire battalion of Spanish regulars, too. However, that was the best option they had. So Captain Bradley ordered the men to disembark and prepare for a hike. They were observed by the Spanish lookouts. There was no hope of pulling this off in total secret, so they raised their banners and they beat their drums and they made for the jungle. Once under the canopy, however, the buccaneers fell silent. The Spanish knew that they were somewhere out in that dense mire of trees and brush and vines, but not exactly where, and not where they would emerge. They weren't particularly worried, however. The castle's commander, Don Pedro de Lizardo, wrote to President Guzman, quote, Although 6,000 men should come against them, he should be able to secure himself and destroy them. End quote. For Bradley and his men, they had a long day of hiking up a mountainside, slicing a path through the undergrowth and hauling up all of their arms and ammunition. But they did have guides there that could show them the way. Unfortunately, those guides weren't very good at their job. They brought the company out of the jungle in a clearing that was in full view of the fortress walls and within firing range. When the English stumbled out of the jungle and blinked at the full light of the sun, a storm of musket shot rained down on them. They lost several men before rallying and retreating back into the trees for cover. Now that they knew just where the castle was, they could plan out an attack properly. That thirty-foot-deep ravine still lay around the castle wall, dug right up to the base of the castle, and then beyond that there was a cleared grassland leading all the way to the tree line. For the pirates to reach San Lorenzo Castle, they would have to pass through this shooting gallery to attack, but really there was nothing for it. The men readied their weapons and then exploded out of the tree line. Hundreds of buccaneers made for the fort, screaming and firing their muskets at the Spanish defenders. Dozens of men fell in the first volley, but most made it to the ravine. Then came a second round of shot, and still more men fell. Then some men broke legs or ankles when they dove down through the steep dirt walls into the ravine. When the rest of the men reached the bottom of the ravine, they faced before them a thirty-foot climb. Carrying, at the time, lit matches in their teeth with grenades and fire pots on their belts, all with the Spanish musket fire and even arrows now falling upon them. Amazingly, some men actually made it to the base of the castle and to light their fire pots. Now their plan was clear to the Spanish. They planned to light the wooden palisade walls on fire and let them burn away through. Now, they managed to start a few fires, but they failed to truly catch. The walls stood strong, and the men retreated back through the ravine and across the grass with the Spanish firing at them all the while. As they ran, a man atop the walls yelled at them, Vingan los dimas, perros ingleses, en amigos de los dios y del rey, vos no habíais de ir a Panama. Or, in English, let the others come too, English dogs, enemies of God and the king, you shall not get to Panama. What happened next was... Well, most historians choose to quote Exquamelon here, because what he records in his account is nearly impossible to credit. He tells us that another attempt was made to storm the walls, this time going even worse than the first. All hopes seem lost to the buccaneers. An arrow fell, hitting a buccaneer in the chest. 
He fell to the ground, but he pulled the arrow from his breast. Ripping a length of cotton from his shirt, he wrapped it around the arrowhead. He loaded this missile in the muzzle of his musket and fired. The cotton that he had wrapped around the arrowhead caught fire, and a flaming arrow sailed over the castle walls, setting fire to the wooden structures beyond. His companions saw this act of daring do, and made to do the same. They would collect Spanish arrows on the ground and then fire them over the walls. Somehow, whether or not this actually happened, a store of gunpowder did catch flame within the walls, and suddenly a mighty explosion rocked the fortress. In several places, the walls started burning from the inside, but the Spanish had little time to put them out. You see, the wall in the explosion had fallen in a key position, and the pirates swarmed that hole. The history of buccaneers' raids in the West Indies are full of accounts of Spanish surrender, attempting to salvage what little they could, but not at San Lorenzo. These weren't the farmers and fishermen that usually made up the militia. These were Spanish regulars, soldiers prepared to defend their castle to the death. Now, at this point, ammunition was running low on both sides, so the battle at the breach turned into a true melee. There was a line of stout pikes waiting beyond the walls for the English, with ranks of bowmen behind. The first wave of pirates through the breach fell to a hail of arrows, and the second. The third was skewered on a foot of steel handled by Spanish pikemen. But more and more buccaneers followed through, like a flood, and soon it fell to swords. English cutlasses met good Spanish steel, and men fought on doggedly, pushing back in between the houses. In the accounts that followed, the English talk time and time again of the bravery and the valor of these Spanish defenders, men who fought on despite bleeding from half a dozen or more cuts. But in time, it became clear that Fort San Lorenzo was lost. Despite that, though, the Spanish refused to compromise their honor. A small contingent of men was ordered to leave the fighting and carry word south to Venta de Cruces and then on to Panama to let their superiors know that the fort was lost and that the pirates planned to use the river. To cover their going, the Spanish fought on. They refused quarter and would give ground only with an almost unbelievable loss of life. Even so, their battle soon became hopeless. Bowmen and musketeers on the Spanish side threw themselves from the palisade walls onto the rocks of the ravine some fifty or sixty feet below rather than surrender to the English. The buccaneers, after they had very clearly won, hunted down every enemy soldier they could find in the castle. They found them hiding in storehouses, barricaded in arms depots, and even, reportedly, hiding under their beds. These men had refused quarter when offered by the pirates, and they would receive none. When only the commander and a handful of troops remained, the English rolled two cannon up to the stout door that they had barricaded themselves behind. But before they could be employed, a sharp-eyed buccaneer caught sight of Don Pedro de Lizardo and shot him between the eyes. At last, San Lorenzo Castle was in the hands of the buccaneers. Now, in the battle itself, the English lost only 30 men dead, with 76 wounded, seriously enough to warrant a mention. Many of those lost limbs or eyes. More still died from their injuries in the following days, from infection or loss of blood. Captain Bradley, who was among the wounded, wound up dying in those following days. The Spanish, on the other hand, lost every soldier, save for a few who defected, who ran away, and those few that were sent with word of the defeat. Those few went to see the man who was now in charge of the defense of Panama. Francisco González Salado was chosen personally by President Guzman to oversee the defense of the Isthmus, and now that San Lorenzo had fallen, he sent orders to his men waiting all throughout the jungle. His trained soldiers, his best men, were all recalled to Panama to defend the city and her treasure, but Salado had made arrangements to secure the road to the city as well. He'd recruited all of those natives and African slaves wherever he could. He'd hired mercenaries and even offered pardon to every prisoner in a cell on the Isthmus. This was not an army. This was 
a poorly trained and poorly armed ragtag group of what were really no more than guerrilla fighters all along the river. Their job was to wait on Captain Morgan and his men, to ambush them, and then to slip back into the jungle, make their way to the next ambush point, and attack again. These men moved to their appointed positions all along the river. They built some new defenses, reinforced those already in place, and set to wait for Henry Morgan. As for Morgan himself, he sailed on San Lorenzo. His coming was somewhat less glorious than Bradley's had been. When he saw the English flag flying over the fort, he made right for the harbor and ran his ship aground on the reef that served as a natural defense for the harbor. The other ships, which were captained by more experienced seamen, sailed around the reef and sent boats out to ferry men and provisions from Morgan's ship to the castle. When they arrived, the men all set about feasting and drinking to their success. Then they set about preparing to move. Three hundred men more were to stay behind and defend San Lorenzo. Their ships were all anchored in the harbor and would be easily defended. They would need the safety of the guns to ensure that the Spanish didn't retake the castle and cut off their escape. When his business in Panama was done, he could trust that San Lorenzo would stand and his ships would be waiting to carry them back to Providence and then on to Jamaica. The rest of the buccaneers, some 1,200 men, prepared to leave. The plan was to take their canoes and small river craft down the Rio Chagres to Venta de Cruces, where they would disembark and take the road to Panama. Now, they were to carry all of the arms and ammunition that they might need to take Panama itself. This was quite a load for the soldiers to carry, with no mules or pack horses, so Morgan ordered that they not carry any food with them. You see, the road to Panama, the river and the road past Venta de Cruces, was littered with villages and plantations, which Morgan planned to attack along the way. He knew that they would have enough cattle and maize, and hopefully some wine, to keep all of his men well fed. It would allow them to move as quickly and lightly as possible. So the fleet of canoes and small river boats was packed full of hardened soldiers. Some of the vessels were so packed, in fact, that men actually had to hang off the sides to stay on the craft as they made their way down the river. Unfortunately, the river was shallow this time of year, so shallow that there were actually exposed roots from the riverside trees and an expanse of mud on either side of the river. That didn't mean, though, that the banks didn't still harbor dangers like the snakes and the caimans and, of course, the men who were waiting for them. Their first planned stop, the place that they planned to stop at the end of their first day, was a plantation called De Los Bracos. Now Morgan's plan was to rest his men after a hard day of rowing and then head inland to find some food. What he didn't know, again, knowledge is the problem here, was that the Spanish had a squad of men laying in wait. These men, these guerrillas, huddled in the brush their eyes watching for the buccaneers and their fingers on their triggers. The first canoe passed, filled with hard-eyed, heavily armed men. Then another passed. Then more. Riverboats, too, filled with yet more dangerous men. As the Spanish defenders looked downriver, they couldn't see an end to the column of buccaneer vessels. The messengers that had come from San Lorenzo reported a force of 400 men taking the castle, with many still wounded or killed in the fighting, so, what, 350 men? But this force was much larger, hundreds and hundreds of men more, a seemingly endless line of the most deadly men in the West Indies. These guerrillas, lying in wait with their fingers on the trigger, held back. The pirates finally called a halt and rode for land. They climbed out of their canoes and they stretched their legs. Some men even sat down and lit pipes. Others lay back and closed their eyes. If there was a perfect time to attack, it was now. And yet, once they pulled the trigger, they might kill, what, fifty men? There had to be hundreds and hundreds of these Lutheran corsairs wide awake, waiting to fire back. The guerrillas had no chance of victory, or probably even of escape, against such overwhelming odds. As the pirates snored, the guerrillas melted away, 
into the mountains of Panama. The fear of death certainly held them back. These men were unwilling to die just to inconvenience the buccaneers, but there's something more here. If the buccaneers had come to conquer Panama, to enslave her people and to take their land, maybe these men would be willing to die in defense of their home. But conquest wasn't Morgan's goal. They would come in, they would kill soldiers, do some villainy in the city, then take all of the gold they could find and leave. All of the king's gold they could find. Why risk your own neck only to defend a pile of treasure that you'll never see a peso of yourself? Much better to let them pass, find a place to hide up in the mountains, and wait until all of this fighting is done. When Don Pedro Lizardo heard about this, and heard about the men who failed to even try taking back San Lorenzo on that same day, he was understandably furious. He needed Morgan's numbers to be culled if he had any hope of success of defending the city. But these men were just unwilling to sacrifice themselves to defend, what, a bunch of the king's gold? Lissardo did have another tactic in hand, though, one that would, in the end, prove very successful. When Morgan roused his men, none the wiser to the musket fire they'd just escaped, they marched on to the plantation de los Bracos, and they found it completely abandoned. The manor, the outbuildings, the slave quarters, all empty. Not a soul to be seen anywhere. This meant no soldiers, so it should have been good news, but the Spanish had taken every scrap of food with them. Not a jug of wine or crumb of bread remained. They searched every inch of the compound to no avail. When the men returned to the boats and made their camp, they did so that night with empty bellies. The second day of the journey was no better. Soon after setting out, it became clear that the river was too low to easily navigate, even in their small river craft. So they rode to the village of Cruz de Juan Gallego, where Morgan had planned to spend the night. From there, he decided to take his army cross-country, through the jungle. He ordered 160 men to stay behind and watch the boats left in the river while the rest of the party trekked into the village. Once again, though, they found the settlement deserted, with no food left behind. The men grumbled and made up their blankets and attempted to catch what sleep they could. Come morning, they set to cutting a path through the jungle with still empty bellies. The guides that they had recruited back at Providence Island assured the men that it would be less difficult cutting through the jungle than taking the river. It wasn't. After a few hours of hacking through the brush, with very little progress made, the men returned to the boats, where they made camp, once again, without eating. On the morning of the fourth day, the men actually set out behind where they had started on the third, and the men began to grumble. They were tired of lifting the boats through the many shallows. They were tired of rowing all day with no food in their bellies. So Morgan decided to split the force in two, half hiking overland and half rowing the boats. After a few hours, the guides pointed out that there was an ambush in the jungle before them. The Spanish would be expecting them to come by river, so the men that were hiking could come upon this ambush unaware. The men pulled out their muskets, made sure their powder was dry, and prepared to attack. They stormed in, guns raised and screaming, only to find the place empty. So recently deserted, in fact, that they could smell the meat that had been roasted on the still smoldering cook fires. But they had left no food behind. There were only a few leather bags strewn around the camp. The men, though, with hunger gnawing at them now, cleaned the fur from the leather proceeded to boil it, dry it, and then eat it in strips. And those were only a few bags to feed more than a thousand men. Picture going hungry for days, and then eating no more than one small piece of nutritionless jerky made out of cow skin. 
Come the fifth day, the men came upon yet another abandoned village. No Indians, no Spanish, no food. Rather than march on, the men decided to search. They searched the entire property for hours, tearing apart every house, every outbuilding, tearing apart every structure they could find. They were repaid for their long search. In a small hollow recently carved into a rock, they found, quote, two sacks of meal, wheat, and like things, with two great jars of wine and certain fruits called platanos, end quote. The food was parceled out almost immediately. Unfortunately, it wasn't enough to feed all of the men, so Morgan ordered it given to the men who were growing too weak to even walk. The rest had to stay hungry. But then on the sixth day, finally, fortune struck. The men came across another abandoned farm, but this time they found a barn full of maize. The men swarmed over the barn, eating the grain just raw. That's raw kernels of corn, uncooked, just chewed and eaten. But to the men, it was a feast. All that this food really did, though, was give the men an opportunity to consider mutiny and returning to the boats. Morgan, they said, some of them, had led them astray, potentially into disaster. But still, they decided against it, at least for the time being. The lure of plunder was just too great. Then, on the morning of day seven, they finally came upon Venta de Cruz, the crossroads of Panama. Sir Francis Drake had stood here in this flyspeck of a village, just before taking the greatest prize in the history of piracy in the West Indies. Morgan, though, if he was successful would match his forebear and perhaps even eclipse him. The import of this wasn't lost on Morgan, but his men weren't concerned with things like that. They'd found loaves of baked bread in one of the houses and jug after jug of good Peruvian wine. So the men gorged themselves, drinking and feasting as late as they could. Many wound up becoming sick due to drinking so much after days of want. Morgan and... Exquamelon as well, knew the real reason, but they told these men that it was some sort of Spanish treachery. After all, they would be marching in more or less open country now, south to Panama. The guerrillas that had been sent to ambush them had all fled, but the Spanish army was waiting. From Venta de Cruces, a road led straight through some mountains to Panama. It was a narrow path with steep, heavily forested mountains on either side, rising very close to the road. But the buccaneers set fire to Venta de Cruces and set to march south. Now here, they finally met the first real resistance force since San Lorenzo. Exquamelon tells us that from the trees, unseen archers sent three or four thousand arrows sailing down to meet the buccaneers. Now, we know today that it was probably no more than three hundred, but these were the native Panamanians, and they shot well. The first few volleys fell quickly, in quick succession, and they hit the tightly packed, unarmored Englishmen. In a path that could hold no more than six or seven men abreast, you didn't need to be a very good shot to hit someone, but the Indians were good shots. When Morgan managed to rally his men, they returned fire, and this ambush melted away. They'd never even seen one of the natives, but the arrows stopped falling. Only a few miles later, though, the arrows began to fall again. This time, the buccaneers were ready, and they returned fire more quickly, but that first volley still took its toll. The men marched now in a proper file, with guns at the ready and eyes watching the trees as closely as possible. They sent out scouts and a vanguard to keep watch for any movement from the trees, and there wasn't another ambush for a while. However, near the end of the mountain path, the buccaneers encountered not just an ambush, but a stout resistance. The arrows began to fall, but when the buccaneers returned fire, the ambush didn't melt away. The natives stood their ground and really fought. Morgan lost more than a few men, and the English remarked on the bravery and the nobility of what they called savages. They compared it to a battle of old, fighting to the last, never surrendering, asking no quarter. 
Near the end of the fighting, the leader of the native force fell to a musket shot, but he still pulled himself up and he thrust his spear through the breast of one of the men who had shot him. Only then did a flurry of shot take him down and these native defenders of Panama finally retreat. This had been bloody fighting on both sides, and Morgan's men didn't walk away from it unscathed, but they licked their wounds, and they made their way onto the plain of Panama. There is a report of a cry coming from the tree line as they make their way onto the plain. Quote, Ha! To the plain! To the plain, ye cuckolds! Ye English dogs! End quote. At least, that's what Exquamelon and his English publishers recorded. I imagine that the native Panamanians didn't actually call the English ye cuckolds, but if they did say anything, what it was was probably unprintable. But then, all of a sudden, the men were free, out of the mountains and overlooking the plain leading down to the city. What they saw there must have looked... Well, it must have looked something like heaven. It was a gently sloping grassland with the Pacific Ocean in the far distance. And there, on the shoreline, Panama. Even more enticing in this pastoral picture were the herds of cattle idly grazing all across the plain. Imagine 1,200 men. Then, imagine them close to starving, and many of them fresh from a nasty, nasty battle. All they've had to eat for nearly ten days is raw corn, boiled leather, and a few bites of bread. What do you imagine would happen when they came upon a plain of fat, slow cattle? The Spanish record seeing the fires dot the hillside like stars in the night sky. They talk about the trickles of blood, coming down the hill, turning to rivers of blood from all of the hastily slaughtered cows. They talk about hearing villainous laughter, singing, and gunshots all throughout the night up on the hillside. That hill became a source of untold fear to the people of Panama, and it burned itself into their consciousness. Still today, it's called El Cerro de los Bucaneros. Exquamelon remembers the men gorging themselves, most unable to even wait for their meat to cook properly. They would bite into less than half-cooked beef with blood and juices filling their scraggly, dirty beards. Their camp had become one of fire and blood, with half-starved, cackling men feasting on raw flesh amid the piles of discarded bone and skin. In short, what had been a scene of heavenly peace only a few hours before had become hell. And the pirates hadn't even reached Panama yet. The Panamanians weren't sitting idly by, though. Don Juan was rousing every soldier, every man-at-arms, every slave, and every farmer that could hold a musket. They assembled some three miles outside of the city, an army made up of infantry, musketeers, artillery, and heavy horse. As the pirates feasted, the Spanish shot off their largest ordnance, though the balls did fall far short of Morgan's men. The infantry in the army sounded their trumpets, and a squadron of fifty horsemen rode forward, just out of musket range, to dance their horses flamboyantly and to jeer at the buccaneers. This was a taunt, but the Englishmen stayed in place and feasted, or let their eyes slip closed while the Spanish horses pranced. This was also an offer of battle, a show of force that harkened back to the Middle Ages. In response, the buccaneers snored. When the horsemen returned, the mood in the camp darkened. They reported 2,000 buccaneers on the hillside. Now, of course, there were far fewer than that. Even starting out, Morgan's force had been no more than 1,800 Taking into account the men he'd left at Providence, at Fort San Lorenzo, and back at the Rivercraft, his force was no larger than 1,200 men, but that's still much larger than the 400 men the San Lorenzo deserters had reported. 
But their general gave a rousing speech to his men. He spoke of the duty in serving their Catholic majesty. He spoke of the honor of dying for God and the king. He told them heaven awaited any man that fell, and glory awaited every man that fought bravely. In the morning, two-thirds of his army had deserted. Don Juan was in a panic. He suffered from an old injury that had nearly crippled his left leg, and it pained him too greatly to ride, so he sent heralds back to the city. Now they pressed every man they could find into service, putting a musket in his hand and herding them to the battlefield. Most of the deserters had been infantry, so the cavalry and artillery were still strong units. To bolster their number, though, Don Juan ordered hundreds of heads of cattle herded out. Some fifty or so herdsmen drove them. Now, Don Juan chose the place of battle well. As the defender, he had that opportunity. A ravine and a large hill stood on his right flank, so he believed that Morgan would be forced to attack his center and the left. The mass of his infantry and artillery formed the center, while the flanks were guarded by cavalry and those herds of cattle. The plan was to send hundreds of steers out to meet Morgan's force, the infantry as they advanced, uh, discombobulating them breaking up their ranks, letting the cavalry harry them all into the center and into Don Juan's waiting guns. Morgan had woken his men early. In fear of a surprise attack, he decided to rouse the men and get them into formation. When no attack came, and he saw firsthand that the Spanish numbers were greatly diminished, he allowed his men to lazily finish off their roasted meat. Still, Morgan had cause to be cautious here, and Don Juan had cause to feel confident. Despite all of those desertions, his force was still numerically superior. He alone possessed horses and cannon, and his plan seemed like a good one. However, it was on the 19th of January, when the sun was near its zenith, that Morgan roused his men, and they marched on the army of Panama. Morgan formed his army into four bodies, each numbering about 300 men, the vanguard out in front would be the first to come into contact with the enemy. Morgan placed it into the capable hands of Lieutenant Colonel Lawrence Prince and Major John Morris. The main body of their force of 600 was then split into two as they approached Panama. Colonel Edward Collier took command of the left flank, and Henry Morgan himself took the right flank. The rear guard, which was basically the reserves, was under the command of one Colonel Bledry Morgan, uh, apparently of no relation to Henry Morgan. The army, marching towards Panama, topped a rise, and they could finally see the enemy's defenses well. On their left flank, well, first I'd like to point out, when we talk about these two flanks, you have to think of it like being on stage. On stage, you would call stage right what lies to your right, even though it would be to the audience's left. The same principle applies here. The defenders, in this case the Spanish, are on stage. The left flank is their left, at least to military historians. Morgan's right is still the left flank. So, upon topping the hill, Morgan saw the weakness in the Spanish plan almost immediately. Their left flank was strong, with plenty of men, with plenty of open space to make maneuvers and easy access for any reinforcements to come in. The right flank looked very strong. That was the flank with the hill and the ravine beyond it, but Morgan saw two things here. First, Don Juan expected his attack on the left due to the natural barriers on the right. Second, that ravine would be a barrier for any Spanish reinforcements to arrive. So he gave out his orders, and the English army advanced. The vanguard, under Prince, moved to engage the right flank, and the wing under Collier moved to take that hill. For the moment, the two units, each under a man named Morgan, held back. So Don Juan ordered a cavalry charge on the van, and several hundred horse stormed off, but Prince knew this was coming, and he was waiting. He'd ordered his men to break into two smaller units, into uh, boxed formations. There would be pikes out front to hold off the horse, and then hundreds of sharpshooters within. When the Spanish horse fell upon them, they would be forced around the two boxes, and either forced in between the two units, or to the outside, where their charge would be basically fruitless. It was a solid move on Prince's part, and it brings to mind some of the more daring maneuvers at the Battle of Waterloo, but in the end, really, it proved unnecessary. Once again, 
the skill of the buccaneers, their marksmanship, proved itself. As the charge made its way towards them, it broke under a hail of iron musket balls. When more than half of their number fell through that first volley, the remaining horsemen just turned tail and ran for the city as hard as their horses could run. In the meantime, Collier was marching the hill. Now he expected a barrage of cannon and musket fire to rain down on him. Taking a hill in any battle has always been a bloody business, but very little came. Maybe the defenders saw the dog's dinner playing itself out down below, or perhaps Don Juan hadn't expected anyone to actually try to take the hill, but it was more of a leisurely hike than a march. Below, though, two forces were on the move. The Spanish infantry was moving in. There were two things that this force didn't know, though. First, they'd been told that the cavalry would have broken the enemy force, which, of course, they hadn't. Second, they had no idea that Henry Morgan's wing was marching in as well to reinforce the van and to make a final push on the city. The two armies, rounding that hill, almost stumbled upon each other. Morgan and the Spanish infantry, they both opened fire and tried to maneuver for better position, but it wasn't a clean battle. Meanwhile, though, the vanguard under Prince was under another kind of charge. Several hundred head of cattle led by a few dozen herdsmen, were moving on him. Can you... can you imagine what that's like? I mean, an hour gone, these men had broken a cavalry charge, several hundred men with guns of their own riding galloping horses at them, and now the Spanish were attempting to whip a bunch of mooing, unhappy steers at them? I mean, really? How did the Spanish think this would turn out? And the herdsmen... Yeah, they were on horses, clearly visible, hollering and whipping away, so the buccaneers loaded their muskets and took aim. Now on the hill, Collier surveyed the battlefield. He'd taken the hilltop with almost no resistance, and he had a clear view of what was laying below him. I can only imagine what an army of cattle looks like, but Morgan was still maneuvering and trading fire with the Spanish infantry, so Collier ordered his men to fall on them. Now, it didn't take the Spanish long to realize what was happening. While Morgan held their attention, firing on them, another force was marching down the hill to trap them. So the Spanish began an uh, orderly withdrawal. They would take their guns, they would turn and fire on the English to keep them back, but keep moving ever away from the battle. Then they felt it, like an earthquake. The retreating Spanish turned and they saw it. Several hundred head of cattle, harried now by English pirates, came flooding around the hill. Their former masters were dead, and the musket fire had roused them to stampede. The English herded them straight at the Spanish infantry. So the last vestige of courage and orderly retreat left them, and the Spanish threw down their guns and ran. The whole battle, up to this point, had taken only about two hours. In his reports back to Spain, Don Juan would decry the cowardice of his men, how they deserted him at every opportunity, how they had failed to properly defend the city, and, well, he wasn't wrong. But there's something here, though, that we can really only see looking back on the events that the Spanish had no notion of, and that the English were only just starting to realize. The Spanish had been told that they were fighting for the church, for Spain, and for honor. The English, though, were fighting for none of that. The buccaneers were fighting for a pile of gold. Now, that's not a pile of gold that's going to go into the coffers of men who are already wealthy. Rather, it was a pile of gold that they could use for whatever they wished. Now, most of them had dreams of buying some land, maybe starting a family. Now, let's be real here, most of them would actually spend their pile of gold on the cheapest rum and most expensive women they could find, but it was theirs to spend. These men, English, French, Dutch, well, they'd left the Middle Ages behind. They weren't beholden to a monolithic church or even the almighty power of an absolute monarch. At least in the West Indies, these men considered themselves free. On the other hand, the Spanish, well, they were still little more than peasants or even, quite literally, slaves. Why would they put their lives on the line to defend their master's gold? They wouldn't, and it showed in the ease of taking Panama. So the battle was over. 
But the fighting wasn't entirely done. They still had the city to take, and that might prove as difficult at the battle outside the walls. As for Panama itself, well, the city in 1671 was a few miles away from where modern-day Panama City stands. It was, even in 1671, an old city, nearly as old as Havana or San Juan, and perhaps even wealthier. As the conduit through which all of that gold and silver flowed, well, a lot of it had a chance to stick in the Panamanians' pockets. The difference, though, is that Havana and San Juan were prepared for an attack. They had castles built of stone, they had armaments, they had storehouses filled to withstand a siege. The north coast of the Isthmus had San Lorenzo and Portobello, to be sure, but the city of Panama itself was far less prepared. See, Panama had never experienced any real threats before. Their position on the Pacific Ocean had always been more than enough to defend them. The closest anyone had come was Drake's attack a century before, but even that hadn't reached the city itself. Henry Morgan was the first, be it pirate king, buccaneer, privateer, admiral, whatever he was, he was the first English commander to lay eyes on this jewel of the New World. And it turns out he didn't like what he saw. For as rich as the city was, she didn't have much in the way of stone buildings. The city hall, the church, maybe a mansion or two, a few warehouses here and there, but nearly all of the city was built out of wood. Even the two hastily erected forts within her walls were made out of wood. The streets inside were narrow, sometimes winding. Any force properly motivated to defend their homes could make taking the city a truly dirty business. So he had plans to lay and he had orders to give, as did the Spanish commander, Don Juan. He'd sworn that Morgan would not take Panama, whatever the cost. So he posted snipers in key locations, crossroads and the like. He built barricades to stop any advancing forces, and he even laid traps. He set casks of gunpowder tactically around the city to explode if the invaders made it in that far. Then he rallied the last remnants of his army and set to defend Panama. Unfortunately, well... Well, Henry Morgan had 600 men who had seen no combat so far, and Don Juan, all he had was a ragtag group of last-minute conscripts who had seen the battle lost so easily from atop their castle walls. Now, exactly what happened within the city next remains unclear. There are conflicting reports from both sides. There was fighting in the streets almost immediately, but no real hope of repelling Morgan. All the Spanish hoped to accomplish was buying time for the women and children, and probably the slaves, to escape carrying as much of their wealth as possible. It was, though, a slow-going, bloody battle. But the Spanish gave up ground while Morgan continued to advance. Then, amidst all the roars of cannon and the smell of gunpowder, they smelled something else. They smelled a wood fire and strong, not the smell of a chimney or even a small fire, it hung heavy in the air, and men coughed and they choked. Visibility all of a sudden was cut down to almost none. So the Spanish and the English both retreated from the streets, and they realized that Panama was going up in flames. Now, Exquamelon states that Morgan set the fires in an act of extreme violence. But we have to remember that Alexander Exquamelon despised Morgan by this point, and his book is riddled with inaccuracies. And then, when we look at the accounts of Morgan and Don Juan Perez de Guzman, they both disagree with Exquamelon. They agree that it was the Spanish that set the fire initially, but they don't agree exactly which Spanish it was. Morgan accuses Don Juan himself of starting the blaze, which he had threatened earlier to do. Don Juan himself blames the panicked citizens of Panama. He blames rebellious slaves and foolish soldiers. Now, we'll never know exactly who set the fires that were quickly engulfing the city, but if we need further evidence that it wasn't Morgan, take a look at these two facts. First, Morgan had threatened to burn cities before, but only ever as a tool to get a ransom for the city, and never before ransacking the town to loot every bit of treasure he could. Second, there's what Morgan actually did next. I'll quote a man who was actually there, who was a sailor and a soldier, and he's actually a man that we'll be looking at in some depth when Morgan's story begins to draw to a close. I'm going to quote Bartholomew Sharp. 
quote, and now we were forced to put all hands to work for the quenching of the fire of our enemies' houses, which they themselves had kindled to disappoint us of the plunder. But all our labor was in vain, for by twelve o'clock at night the whole city was burnt, except a part of the suburbs, which, with our great industry, we made a shift to save, being two churches and about three hundred houses. End quote. So rather than burning and ransacking, the pirates actually made an effort to save Panama, mostly to save the jewels and plunder they would find inside, but why would they do that if they had set the fires in the first place? Now anyone who had slept in Panama, and I imagine that that night not many people got any sleep, but they would have woken to find most of Panama burned to ashes. That morning must have been a somber one for all of the citizens of the city, but also for the buccaneers. Not only had they fought a battle the day before, but they spent the entire night fighting fires all across the city. And now, well, most of the city's occupants had escaped with their valuables. What was left behind had mostly been lost in the fire. Still, the pirates began the long and probably thankless task of sifting through the rubble to find something of value. Still, more men were sent out in search parties to find anyone who had fled the city. They found a few, and they interrogated them over the whereabouts of their valuables. Some held back, but most of them spoke about loading their gold and gems onto a ship. In the city, they were having some luck. A small bark had arrived in the Pacific Harbor at Panama, despite the express orders of Don Juan that no ship make call in the city. It was immediately seized by the pirates and outfitted with more guns, as they are wont to do. Now Morgan put her under the command of one Captain Searle. The ship, as soon as it was ready, sailed the shore around Panama. They explored every island they came across. They explored every inlet and every harbor they found. Now, they came upon a few ships, but carrying only people from the city who had no valuables on their person. They all talked, however, and they spoke, every one of them, about a ship that had been loaded with treasure. At one such harbor, the pirates found a store of wine and rum, and decided to take a little R&R on the shore and enjoy that rum and wine as thoroughly as they knew how. In the midst of their revelry, though, they were interrupted by what I imagine was a pretty surprised party of Spaniards. The men, the Englishmen, were all well and truly drunk, but they still got a little news out of these Spanish people who had walked up on them. They were from a ship called La Santissima Trinidad. That ship out of Panama, loaded with all of the gold and silver and jewels of the city. Searle ordered all of the men to the boats, but every one of them was ashore with a belly full of wine. By the time they actually managed to row out to the ship and get her ready to sail, the Spanish galleon, full of all of Panama's treasure, was lost over the horizon. Now, they gave chase, of course, but the Spanish knew every hidden cove in the region, and the English didn't dare search all of them that they could find, just in case the Spanish had simply sailed as hard as they could to escape the pirates. They did, in their search, fall upon a few other ships carrying silk and dyes and logwood and the like, which was valuable cargo which they loaded onto their own bark, but it wasn't the windfall of gold and jewels that they were looking for. In the end, they were forced to sail back to Morgan and tell him of their failure. Now, they thought that Once they had more ships in their possession, as they did now, maybe they might be manned to conduct a more thorough search. However, in the city they had had a bit better luck finding some treasure. A ship had sailed into harbor carrying, well, not much really. It had some soap and cotton, but it also had a chest of 20,000 pesos on board. Now that might be a decent haul on most pirate raids, but this was going to be divided between 1,800 men, and that amounts to only about 11 pesos each. Less, really, once the shares for the governor and the king and the admiralty and the captains and the surgeons and the carpenters and the wounded, once all of that was taken into account, for most of the men it was like getting a few bucks at best. However, those that had spent their time searching the city had found caches of gold and gems hidden about. They were hidden in wells and at the bottom of cisterns. There were hidden compartments built into some wine cellars under the altars of one of the churches and simply buried in some shallow holes. They found a little bit of treasure, so slowly it was beginning to trickle in. They searched for about three weeks or so, but finally on February 14th, 
the Buccaneers decided to leave Panama. They wouldn't be going alone, though. There was an army of mules and pack horses that went with them, carrying all of their plunder, along with about 600 women and children. Now, they served two purposes. First, they would act as hostages against any enemy action on their march back to Las Cruces and then on to San Lorenzo. Second, if the people of Panama had any more treasure hidden away, especially on this nearly legendary galleon, well, perhaps they could bleed a bit more out of the city if Morgan let it be known that they would stop at Las Cruces and wait. Every hostage taken had a ransom on their head, and any who could reach the outpost with the ransom could take their loved ones back to Panama in peace. Many did arrive with sacks of silver to buy back their relatives. So many actually brought silver that a lot of the buccaneers argued for going back to the city to search further. But still, not enough. By the 24th, when their boats were loaded with loot, Morgan was still saddled with far more prisoners than he'd expected. So he sent another message to Panama. He said that he would wait again at San Lorenzo, giving the city more time to raise the ransom. But when he left the coast, it would be with the rest of the women and children in tow, bound for Port Royal. You can imagine the kind of fears that must have been building in the minds of the Spanish with their wives and daughters in the hands of these villains. Next, Wimellan certainly could, and he actually wrote about an episode involving Morgan and the wife of a local merchant at some length. When they reached San Lorenzo Castle on the North Sea, the prisoners left with the buccaneers were put into a church under guard. One woman, though, again, only according to Exquemelin, was housed in much more lavish accommodations. She was given a private room. She was given a slave to keep her company and to see to her needs. She was allowed visits from her friends, and Morgan himself brought her meals from his table, the finest food available in the castle. Then she received a letter from Morgan, and he encouraged her to, quote, consent to her own dishonor, end quote. The next day, Morgan arrived in person with a wealth of jewels in hand, a gift if she consented to his, quote, inflamed lust. She refused. She was a chaste and honorable woman, refusing to consent to Morgan's debaucheries. Morgan had her locked in a cell. He had all of her companions removed, along with all of her clothes, and he fed her at this point only bread and water and small helpings of each. So she was cold and she was hungry and she was afraid. She was a helpless prisoner, but still she refused to succumb, praying to God to give her strength and not to fault her. And Exquamelon goes on and on about Morgan's villainy and this unnamed woman's chastity for pages. And all of it is just total nonsense. You mean to tell me that Henry Morgan, a man who, in, again, Exquamelon's narrative, ordered people's skin cut off on the rack for a sack of silver, waited on a woman giving her consent? You mean to tell me that Henry Morgan, a man who, Exquamelon claims, burned the city of Panama to the ground for some reason to the detriment of his own financial and military gain, let his inflamed lust wait on a woman agreeing to compromise her honor? Balderdash. Now, there are accounts given by other men that were on this voyage. They all claimed this episode with the merchant's wife never happened. But these are actually testimonies given in an admiralty court, and the men might have been protecting their captain or even their own reputations, so they're not much more reliable than Exquamelon. Now certainly, there were rapes done in Panama. You don't take a city by force and escape that eventuality. No army ever in history has escaped that. But Morgan did try. Some men fled the ranks of soldiers as they were taking the city and found wine and women as soon as they entered, but Morgan ordered prisoners taken as soon as possible and executed or exiled any man who harmed any of his prisoners. So no other accounts exist of Morgan tormenting any prisoner, especially a young woman. And in the end, when no ransom came, Morgan didn't follow through with his threats. He didn't take Panama's wives and daughters back to Jamaica. He released them with guides to actually return them home. Is that the action of a man trying to force a woman to consent? It seems very like Exquamelon was just 
building up resentment against Morgan for his next accusation, which might actually carry a little bit more weight. While they were at San Lorenzo, Morgan had all of the treasure taken in Panama, collected, counted, and appraised. They would estimate the sale price of the silks and the dyes and such, and they would count that to each man's share. Then he brought each man on the voyage before him, made him swear an oath that no treasure had stuck itself in his pockets, and had each man searched. When all was finally accounted, and all of the plunder was divided according to the code, each man walked away with only about two hundred pieces of eight. For men, who had been asked to endure months of hardship, to risk life and limb in heated battle, and who were denied some of the baser pleasures of conquest, this was a disappointment. Exquamellan asserts that Morgan and his cronies, landed Jamaican officers all, stole the bulk of the treasure and hid it on their ships. Now, naturally, Morgan would go on to deny this, and most historians agree with him. Graham A. Thomas, in his book The Pirate King, argues that, well, Morgan was not exactly anonymous. He owned a plantation, he owned two plantations, and he had an estate in Spanish Town. He had a wife and a family that could be easily tracked down and killed in retribution. Why would he steal some gems and gold from men that would surely come to look for it when his estates, well, they grew enough sugar and made rum which could earn him more than a raid in any given year? He wouldn't. The reality here is that Morgan wasn't acting as a pirate. He was acting as an admiral for the interests of Jamaica and the British Empire. But Exquamelon and the rest of the men were certainly disappointed, and they were angry. Then two ships arrived in San Lorenzo flying English colors. What news they brought isn't exactly known, but we can speculate with near certainty. With the departure of these two ships, Morgan, Prince, Collier, and all the lieutenants of his army left on four ships in a great hurry. Exquamelon states that it was to escape the angry pirates who were bent on mutiny, but it's generally accepted today that Morgan had finally received the news of a treaty between England and Spain, the Treaty of Madrid, and the revocation of his letters of mark. And it occurred to him that he and his friends might just be in a great deal of trouble. And as Captain Morgan sails away from San Lorenzo Castle, here marks the end of Captain Morgan's last great raid on the Spanish New World. Originally, I had intended to finish the tale of Captain Morgan on this episode, to mark the end of the era and move on, but I've come to realize that that's not possible. Morgan's story in Caribbean piracy is far from finished, although his role is about to change. You see, Morgan had been the last great admiral of the Brethren of the Coast, and with his departure from San Lorenzo Castle, the fleet that he had assembled dispersed. But that doesn't mean that these men went home. Men who had been at Panama would terrorize the coasts of Nicaragua and the Mosquito Coast for months to come. They would build new bases now that the treaty between England and Spain had made Port Royal and even Tortuga less than opportune places to be. They would dig in all across the Caribbean, and then they would spread out. But these weren't the privateers of Captain Morgan's navy. These were true pirates, and they were searching for a true pirate haven. These men would go on to harry Spanish galleons all across the Caribbean. They would attack English merchants in North America. They would sack Portuguese and Dutch slavers off the coast of Africa, and even, eventually, mogul ships in the Indian Ocean. As Captain Morgan sailed away from San Lorenzo Castle to face whatever was waiting for him in Port Royal, the next generation of Caribbean pirates was preparing to sail farther than any ever had before. 